this is a beautiful number theory problem. Which positive integers n is 2 power n a factor of 3 power n minus 1? And at the end of this video, I'll explain a revolutionary and deep piece of mathematics intrinsically connected to our universe that is basically related to solving this problem here. So in order to find out what the answer is, we're going to start off with small values of n and then go through some general number theory principles. So the first thing to do is to think about small values of n and you'll see something quite crazy at first glance that we will see some pattern that doesn't actually persist. So n equals 1, what we're looking at is 2 power 1, which is 2, and we're looking at 3 power 1 minus 1, which is going to be 2 as well. That's going to be 3 power 1 minus 1. And you see here that 2 is a factor of 2. Okay, it's a divisor of 2. So n equals 1 is a value of n for which this is true. Let's keep going. Okay, as we keep going, we're going to find out the pattern, okay, step by step. n equals 2, you can keep going. It's going to be 2 power 2, which is going to equal to 4. And then 3 power 2 minus 1, which is going to be 9 minus 1, which is 8. And you see 4 is a divisor of 8. So this vertical sign means divisor of, okay, it's in mathematical notation. n equals 3, things get interesting. 2 power 3 is going to be 8. But 3 power 3 minus 1 is going to be 27 minus 1, which is 26. And actually, 8 does not divide 26. So I put a hash there to say it does not divide 26. So n equals 3 is not a value of n. Now, we can, of course, keep going with this. Let's go one more value. Or let's go two or three more values. Let's do n equals 4. And then we're going to understand the theoretical math behind it. So n equals 4, we're going to get 2 power 4, which is 16. And 3 power 4 minus 1, which is 80. And remarkably, 16 is a factor of 80 because 16 times 5 is 80. But what's interesting is you kind of see, okay, for n equals 2, it's true. For n equals 4, it's true. Is it true for all even values of n and maybe false for all odd values of n or maybe something like that? Well, 1, it's true. What about n equals 5? Well, for n equals 5, you get 2 power 5 is 32. And 32 and 3 power 5 minus 1 is going to be 242. Now, 32 does not go into 242. Okay, you can verify that yourself. So it fails for n equals 5 and n equals 6. You know, math's a journey. We just try to do it step by step. And then we're going to try to hypothesize how we're going to approach the proof. n equals 6, it's interesting. We're going to get 64. And then we're going to get 3 power 6 minus 1. So 3 power 6 is going to be 729 because 3 power 5 is 243. And so times 3 is going to be 729. And so I'm going to get 728 for 3 power 6 minus 1. And 64 does not divide 728. Okay, you can check that 64 does not divide 728. Um, and this is actually quite interesting. So it fails for n equals 5 and fails for n equals 6. What's the pattern here? What's going on and how do we actually prove it? So the first thing we could try to guess, and this is not necessarily a correct guess, is the only values are n equals 1, 2, and 4. And what's the theory behind that guess? Well, the theory behind that guess is 2 power n gets to be a bigger and bigger power of 2. And to say that it's a factor of 3 power n minus 1 is to say 3 power n minus 1 is highly divisible by 2. You know, for n equals 6, you're already looking at 64 going into 3 power n minus 1. That seems less and less likely. It's not a proof, but it's just a heuristic argument we can look into that explains why it's true for small values of n and why it starts failing as you get to larger values of n. We don't know all n though, and we have to rigorously prove it. So let's just get into an argument now to understand what's going on based on the principle I just shared. All right, so let's now think about how divisible 3 power n minus 1 is by powers of 2. Is it divisible by 2, 4, 8, 16, etc.? Let's try to rigorously understand this. And let's actually start off with just how divisible is it by 4? Okay, let's divide by 4. Let's look at n odd and n even separately because we saw n equals 1 was a case where 2 power n was a factor of 3 power n minus 1. But higher values that are of n that are odd, we did not see. So let's look at n odd and let's look at 3 power n minus 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to take remainders when you divide by 4. So we're going to look at things modulo 4. Now, when you look at remainders, you can actually do something called modular arithmetic, which if you know already, you know, it'll be streamlined. And if you don't know, I'll make it easy for you. So 3 power n minus 1, when you think about the remainder when you divide 3 by 4, it's actually the same as a remainder when you divide minus 1 by 4. Okay, so 3, what we say is 3 is congruent to minus 1 mod 4. And we use this symbol. Okay, and what's interesting is that when you take powers of 3, say you take 3 squared, the remainder when you divide 3 squared by 4 is the square of the remainder when you divide 3 by 4. Okay, so this is how modular arithmetic is very convenient. 3 squared is going to be congruent to minus 1 squared mod 4. 
And you can actually check that. You know, three squared is nine divided by four, its remainder is one. Then you look at three cubed, and three cubed is 27. Its remainder when you divide by four is three, or equivalently minus one, if you allow negative remainders. And so this is going to be congruent to minus one cubed mod four, which is just minus one mod four, as we just saw. So in general, you know that three power n is going to be congruent to minus one power n mod four, uh, that means its remainder when you divide by 4 is minus 1 power n. And if n is odd, okay, and we're seeing, we're thinking about odd and even separately. When n is odd, so I'm just going to write it here, when n is odd, minus 1 power n is congruent to minus 1. It's minus 1 mod 4. So therefore, this is going to be congruent to minus 1 mod 4, which implies that 3 power n minus 1 is going to be congruent to minus 2 mod 4, which is also 2 mod 4. Okay, the remainder when minus 2 is divided by 4, 4 times minus 1 plus 2. Same as remainder when 2 is divided by 4. So this is congruent to 2 mod 4. And so we see that its remainder is not 0. So 3 power n minus 1 is not divisible by 4. Okay, so this is not divisible by 4. And why is that interesting? Because the heuristic thing we're trying to look at is how divisible this is by powers of 2. So if it's not divisible by 4, well, when n is greater than or equal to 2, and n is odd, right? So I'm just going to write it out. Therefore, if n is greater than or equal to 2, 2 power n is not a divisor of 3 power n minus 1. Okay, because it cannot be divisible. 3 power n minus 1 is not divisible by 4. It cannot be divisible by any higher power of 2, whether that's 8, 16, etc., because they're all divisible by 4. So if n is odd, the only possible value of n for which 2 power n is a factor of 3 power n minus 1 is n equals 1. And as we saw, that actually works. And you get 2 and 2 on both sides. So it is a divisor. So we've actually ruled out all odd values of n greater than 1 for 2 power n being a factor of 3 power n minus 1. The next one's going to be so beautiful is even n. And we're going to do a very cool trick here. Okay, so let's get into that now. Also, if you're enjoying my content so far, please don't forget to leave a like on the video. It makes a huge difference for engagement on the video. And subscribe to my channel for lots more fun math content across all topics and levels. I do everything on my channel. I also want to give a huge thank you so much to Alex, Nathan, and Trang for their ongoing support as gold members of my Patreon. It makes a huge difference, and I'm immensely grateful for their support. And also to Enehota Ney JR for their ongoing support as a YouTube channel Silver member. If you want to support my channel, please consider looking in the description for links to my Patreon or YouTube membership by clicking the Join button. It makes an immense difference. I currently do everything on my own, editing, creating thumbnails, video ideas, preparing videos, recording videos, uploading, scheduling, and having the support of a few people is a whole game changer for me because I can really outsource a lot of the work. I want to create infinite free accessible math education. I love creating math content across all topics and levels. And by being able to outsource the work, I can really up the game and really create tons more math content. So every contribution makes a huge difference. If you want to support the channel, please consider doing so on the link in the description. Or even if you're just watching, it also makes a huge difference. So thank you so much for your ongoing support. Let's get into n being even and try to understand what happens there. So you have 3 power n minus 1, um, and we're going to look at n being even. Okay, so I'm going to say n is even. And now with 3 power n minus 1, if n is even, you can write n is equal to 2m. Okay, so n is equal to 2m for some positive integer m. And if n is equal to 2m, then you can write this as 3 power 2m minus 1. And we want to figure out what is the highest power of 2 that goes into that. Ideally, it's not going to be too high, and that's going to rule out large values of n. But we already know that when n is equal to 2 or n equals 4, we know this is true, that it is a factor of 3 power n minus 1. So our argument's going to have to reveal that somehow. So let's look at 3 power 2 n minus 1. We want to understand factors, and it's interesting that this is a difference of squares. So let's play around with that. 3 power 2m minus 1 squared is going to equal to 3 power m minus 1 multiplied by 3 power m plus 1. Okay, it's a difference of squares formula. We get a product like this. And I have a video on the difference of squares formula too on my channel. So I've got everything basically. That's what I try to do everything on my channel. So 3 power m minus 1 times 3 power m plus 1. And now what is the highest power of 2 that goes into this? Okay, how do we actually understand this? So here's an interesting thing. Okay, the first observation is that when m is odd, we actually already studied this. When m is odd, we know 3 power m minus 1 is congruent. We saw this just now. 3 power m minus 1 is congruent to 2 mod 4. And that already tells us that the highest power of 2 that goes into 3 power m minus 1, that divides 3 power m minus 1, is 2 itself. 
Okay, so I'm just going to write that out in a little red here. I'm just going to say that the highest power of 2 that could possibly go into 3 power m minus 1 is going to be 2. Okay, that's when m is odd. And now the other thing is what about 3 power m plus 1 when m is odd? So when m is odd, we saw that 3 power m minus 1 is congruent to 2 mod 4. So 3 power m plus 1 is going to be congruent to 2 plus 2 mod 4. If you add 2 to 3 power m minus 1, you get 3 power m plus 1. So we know that 3 power m plus 1 is going to be congruent to 0 mod 4. It's going to be divisible by 4. So this could have a high power of 2 in it. We don't know. It's at least going to be 2 squared. Could be a higher power of 2. So let's look at, we know some power of 2. Okay, 2 power something. I'm just going to put that in a box. Now here's the thing. In order for 3 power n minus 1, for m odd, for in order for it to be divisible by 2 power n, which is 2 power 2m, for m odd, this power of 2 has to be pretty large. Okay, so I'm going to actually write that down here. So let's write that down precisely. So if 2 power 2m, okay, so if 2 power 2m divides 3 power 2m minus 1, then that implies the following. It implies that 2 power 2m minus 1 has to divide 3 power m plus 1. Okay, because we know that at most 2 is the highest power of 2 dividing this. So 2 power 2m minus 1 has to at least be that power of 2 dividing 3 power m plus 1. And so now we're getting somewhere because this is going to actually equal to 2 power 2m is 4 power m. Okay, so it's going to be 4 power m has to divide 2 times 3 power m plus 1. And this is very interesting because 4 power m is going to be much, much larger. It's going to grow much faster than 3 power m, right? So it's not going to be possible for this to be true unless m is small. And already we're getting some insight here. So when m is small, you can already see if m is 1, then the left-hand side is 4, and the right-hand side is going to be 3 plus 1 times 2, which is going to be 8. And then when m is odd, when m is 3, for example, when m is equal to 3, you're going to get 4 cubed, and then the right-hand side is going to equal to 28 times 2, which is 56, which is much smaller than 4 cubed, which is 64. So knowing that 4 power m grows much faster than 3 power m plus 1 times 2 um, with m, you know that as soon as 4 power m exceeds this, it's going to exceed it forever. So m equals 1 is the only time this can happen. Okay, so when m is odd, we say therefore m has to be 1. And now I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise just for practice. When m is even, how would this argument go? Just to kind of understand the practice, you should get m equals 2 as the only solution. And in this case, just to give you a hint, you can pause the video if you don't want to see the hint, but you can then actually, you, the picture gets reversed. So when m is even, 3 power m minus 1 is not going to be congruent to 2 mod 4. It's going to be congruent to something else. It's going to be congruent to 0 mod 4. Okay, so if you play around with that, you can then figure out when m is even, m has to equal to 2, and that will complete the proof. Now, if you have other proofs, please let me know. I'd love to read down in the comments below. But that's a rough, that's an argument. That's a formal proof that 2 power n is a factor of 3 power n minus 1, precisely when n is 1, 2, or 4. And it uses the heuristic principle that being divisible by a high power of 2 is very difficult for 3 power n minus 1. And now for the revolutionary and deep piece of math I mentioned at the beginning of the video, which I, which I promised, is that n equals 1, 2, and 4 are the only dimensions of number systems, okay, which rigorously in math we call real division algebras. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you look at the following, and I'm just going to erase this from the board, we have the following number systems, okay? So we have n equals 1. In dimension 1, we have the real numbers, okay? That's fine. For n equals 2, in dimension 2, we have the complex numbers, okay? The complex numbers are just, as we know, all numbers of the form a plus ib, where a and b are real numbers, and that is what is called a two-dimensional division algebra over the real numbers. What does that mean? It means that you can divide by whenever the denominator is non-zero, you can add, and all the usual laws are satisfied, okay? Except one law, which is commutativity. It's satisfied for the complex numbers. It's not going to be satisfied for next number system, okay? But for the complex numbers, you have a natural addition and multiplication and division and subtraction. But for n equals 4, you have what is called the quaternions. I'm just going to write it down as h, okay? I, I could do a bald face h like this. Okay, this is basically going to be a different system. It's four-dimensional. It's all numbers of the form a plus ib plus jc plus kd, where a, b, c, and d are all going to be real numbers. Okay, and to explain what the i, j, and k are, I'm just going to do it on this side of the board briefly. Just like in the complex numbers, once you know that i squared is minus 1, you can multiply them and add them, right? You add them by grouping like terms, the real and imaginary parts, and you can multiply them by just, you know, 
using the distributive law for multiplication with respect to addition and use the fact i squared is minus 1. For the quaternions, you can do that once I explain to you how to multiply the ij's and k's. And the rule is pretty simple that i squared is j squared is k squared is minus 1. Okay, they're all square roots of minus 1. And it's very interesting. And now we're going to have these super interesting laws that it's not commutative. Okay, so the order of multiplication matters. ij is going to equal to k, but that's actually going to be negative ji. Okay, second of all, we're going to have that jk is going to equal to i, but that's actually going to be negative kj. And finally, we're going to have that ki is going to equal to j, which is going to be negative ik. Okay, so if you actually absorb these, you can use these laws to actually multiply any pair of quaternions. Okay, and you can divide them. Every quaternion has a multiplicative inverse. You can divide them, you can add them. It's just not commutative with multiplication. The order of multiplication matters. But it's so beautiful that you have this system, okay, and it's what's called a real division algebra. But you don't have any other dimensions where you have such a real division algebra. There's no other dimensions where you can create a number system like this. And that can be proved in a number of ways. One way I'm thinking about is algebraic topology and k-theory, where you can actually reduce the proof down to the statement that the ends for which you can find a real division algebra of dimension n is n equals to 1, 2, or 4, which comes from the number, the numbers n, so the 2 power n is a factor of 3 power n minus 1. Now, you do have other number systems in dimension 8, for example. You have the octonians, but the octonians are not associative for multiplication, which means that you can't make unambiguously the sense of multiplying three things, a, b, and c. a, b times c is different from a times b, c. Okay, but when you include the associativity law, you only have one, two, and four. So it's so beautiful. If you want to see a video on that, that's more theoretical math. I do it all on my channel. So the next video I'm going to recommend to you. So drop a comment down below if you want to see a proof of that or math theory leading up to that. I'd love to do it if there's interest. And now if you love this video, I've got two fun video recommendations for you. The first one is a proof that the LCM, the least common multiple of 1, 2, 3 up to n, is always greater than 2 power n. It's a very subtle and deep statement relating to the distribution of prime numbers. And this is the most beautiful proof I've seen in math. It uses integration, very basic integration. Check it out here. You're going to love it. Okay, it's, it's just crazy. It's just the craziest proof, the most beautiful proof I've ever seen. So simple. And here's another video you're going to love if you want to get more into number theory, more into theory of number theory. Check this video out. It's a master class on the Euler torsion function. I teach you everything that you need to know about the Euler torsion function, all the fundamentals right from scratch. How many numbers from 1 to 2,000 are relatively prime to 2,000? You can immediately say that. Check it out there. Wish you all the best and catch you later.